those sheep. In fact, you look at his life and, and you're amazed at all those musts that even seem to have filtered down to what we would call a mundane experiences of life. Here's Jesus in the city of Jericho and he's walking by and there's a little short man. I guess if he's little, he's also short, but he's, at least this one is, he's in a tree. And Jesus looks at him and says, Zacchaeus, come down because I must dine with you today. You almost get the impression that God the Father and God the Son in eternity past decided to write a symphony. And they mapped out the life of Jesus Christ, both the harmony and the dissonance, and, and they said that this is what is going to be followed. This will be your job description. So that whether it is preaching the Sermon on the Mount, whether it is the raising of Lazarus, or whether it is having lunch with a tax collector, you will fulfill the plan that we agreed on. That symphony written in heaven will be played out. His vocation was necessary. It had the stamp of necessity. I must. Secondly, you'll notice that his death was necessary. For this, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 16, a very familiar passage of Scripture. Matthew 16, where Jesus said, Who do men say that I am? And you'll recall, of course, that uh, none other than Peter answers and says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. What a wonderful reply. And Jesus said, to Peter, I want you to know that you'd have never come on to this truth on your own. Blessed are you, Simon, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Parentheses. If you're here today believing that Christ is Savior and you have received him, it is because God has revealed it to you. Then we pick up the text in verse 21 of Matthew 16. From that time, Jesus Christ began to show to his disciples, and there's our word, don't miss it, that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer these things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. He must do it. No choice. He must. Now, of course, uh, Peter, incidentally, begins to rebuke him. And uh, Peter was saying, in effect, that's beneath your dignity because you are the Son of God. I want to see you have the glory, but I don't want you to see or experience the grime. I want you, O oh Lord, to inherit the crown, but I don't want to see you on the cross. Lord, this cannot happen to you. And Peter was trying to stand in the way of what Jesus said must come to pass. By the way, Peter had no idea what he was saying. He meant well, just like some advice that may be given to us at times, may be uh, given by well-meaning friends. But Jesus said, you are not experiencing or seeing things from God's viewpoint, but from your own, Peter. Peter didn't realize that if Jesus had taken his advice, Peter himself would have been lost in eternity forever. By telling Christ that he should cancel Easter, he was in effect undercutting the very work that would in the end redeem him. So Peter the rock here becomes a stone of stumbling. But for our purposes, it's that little word must in verse 21. I must go to Jerusalem. I must suffer from the elders and from the chief priests. Christ must do that. Thirdly, not merely his vocation and his death, but even the details of his death. His betrayal, for example, and the details of his betrayal and the night before he was crucified. All of that had also been driven by the necessity of a must. Notice Luke 22. Take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 22 where Jesus is speaking here and he is preparing to go to the cross. 
Ahead of him lies Gethsemane and all of the horror of what he is to experience. Verse 37, For I tell you that that which is written, there's our word, that which is written must be fulfilled in me. And he was classified among the criminals. For that which refers to me has its fulfillment. In other words, uh, the Father and I mapped this out. And the reason that I have to go this route is not because the prophets said so, but rather the prophets said so because they were merely reflecting what the Father and I agreed upon. Now, if we had enough time, and we don't, we could look at a whole list of other musts that cluster around the cross. From the life of Jesus, you've just heard Dr. Erwin Lutzer with part one of his message, Things That Must Come to Pass. Tomorrow, join us as we hear about more of the certainties we all must face. Running to Win comes to you from the Moody Church in Chicago. We believe this brief series will help you understand what really matters in life and in eternity. Our series on things can be yours on CD as our thank you when you give a gift of any amount to support Running to Win. For details, call 1-800-215-5001. That's 1-800-215-5001. On the Internet, go to OfferRTW.com. That's OfferRTW, all one word, dot com. Or write to Running to Win, Box 11174, Chicago, Illinois, 60611. This is Dave McAllister. Join us for tomorrow's Running to Win.